Welcome, you're watching Vox News, your daily evening news with Rita Kumkumo. Our headlines today, Tanzanian President John Magufuli dissolves parliament ahead of the October general election and promises a fair vote. Uganda bans rallies and gatherings as part of its upcoming general election campaigns to opposition leader Bobby Wine's dismay. The president of Mali says he will hold talks on establishing a new unity government after thousands demanded his resignation. Our top story today, Tanzanian President John Magufuli proceeded on Tuesday to the dissolution of parliament to allow the organization of general elections in October, although his party holds the majority in the National Assembly. The president promised a free and fair vote as the opposition continues to denounce a climate of violence and intimidation. President Magufuli, in office since 2015, explained that the parliament had to be dissolved following the constitution to allow the holding of presidential and legislative elections, for which dates have not yet been set. This dissolution comes a week after the attack on the leader of the main opposition party, Freeman Bowie, denounced as politically motivated by his Chadema party. Tanzanian police have cast doubt on the allegations. In Uganda, the Electoral Commission unveiled a roadmap for the 2021 general elections to take place between the 10th of January and the 8th of February as planned, relaying fears of a potential delay due to the coronavirus pandemic. However, the decision to ban rallies and public gatherings and that candidates should only use media outlets during the electoral campaign is stirring controversy. Opposition leader Bobby Wine argued that those rules will make it even more difficult for opposition voices to be heard, as opposition politicians struggle to get media access in the country. The 38-year-old opposition leader, who has been subject to repeated arrests, is expected to run against 75-year-old outgoing president Yoweri Museveni in power since 1986. In Mali, after weeks of severe criticism from the opposition coalition and a massive protest demanding his resignation, embattled President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita made a major announcement on Tuesday. I have decided to start talks to form a unity government. My plan has never been to exclude anyone. My project is Mali. In his speech, the president also suggested initial steps towards reforming the constitutional court as well as the national parliament and gave Malian citizens news of leading opposition figure Soumaïla Sissé kidnapped on the 25th of March by jihadists. With regards to Soumaïla Sissé, he is alive. We have proof that he is alive. Efforts are underway to secure his liberation quickly. These multiple announcements came as President Keita has been struggling to maintain political support since the jihadist revolt first broke out in the north of the country in 2012 and after thousands of protesters led by the opposition coalition took to the streets of Bamako on the 5th of June, demanding his departure over lack of government response to jihadist violence, poor governance and fraud accusations. In the Central African Republic, voter registration material arrived over the weekend in the country's capital city, Bangui, ahead of the general elections scheduled for the 27th of December. The process is progressing very well. There has already been electoral mapping that has been fully completed. The establishment, therefore, of the National Election Authority branches throughout the national territory. The Constitutional Court ruled earlier this month that there will be no extension of President Foster Kanjdoadeira's mandate, allowing the maintenance of the scheduled date for the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections, despite the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. I'm not saying it's easy. We had the arrival of a visitor who has COVID-19, but together with the government, the WHO, the Minister of Health, we are fighting the spread of the virus. The authorities received 32 tons of election material, including 4,400 tablets for voter registration.
In Burkina Faso, the opposition accused on Tuesday outgoing President Rock Mark Christian Cabore in power since December 2015 of having made the country's security situation worse, asking him not to seek a second term in the November presidential election. The president of the Rally of the Ecologists of Burkina, Adama Sere, denounced a chaotic management of the security crisis in the country, plagued by numerous jihadist attacks since early 2015, citing nearly a million of internally displaced people the death of more than 2,000, the closure of over 4,000 schools, and the fact that terrorists occupy a third of the national territory. The opposition also requested the resignation of Ouagadougou mayor Armand Pierre Bewende, member of the presidential party, over corruption allegations. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a coronavirus treatment center was ransacked on Tuesday in the South Kivu region when a riot erupted over the killing of a young man. The attack on the Bwindi treatment center by a few young people occurred in retaliation after an identified gunman had shot and killed the young man on Monday, according to the provincial authorities, who mentioned a rumor claiming that the man was killed by police who were enforcing a curfew declared by Governor Theo Kassi to stop the spread of coronavirus. The governor promised that justice will be served for the victim's relatives and vowed that police will conduct a thorough investigation into the young man's death. The World Bank announced on Tuesday it had approved a billion US dollars in grants and loans to promote free primary education and access to health care in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Bretton Woods Institution allocated $800 million to help support free primary education in the poorest provinces, mainly in the east and center of the country and the capital city Kinshasa, as part of the implementation of the Equity and System Strengthening in Education project. The remaining $200 million will help to improve response to health emergencies in 14 provinces, especially for mothers and children. Jean-Christophe Carré, World Bank's Director of Operations for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, believes these two projects will help the most vulnerable populations access basic services. The Congolese Justice announced on Tuesday that a murder investigation is underway into the death of Judge Rafael Yanni, who presided the highly publicized corruption trial of President Tshisekedi's top aide Vital Kamere. According to Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Justice Celestin Kazende, the late high-profile judge had died on the 27th of May after receiving head trauma and fatal blows on his skull. The minister said Judge Yanni died of a hemorrhage caused by head trauma, contradicting police statement that the cause of death was cardiac arrest, citing conclusions of an autopsy he said was carried out by a Congolese forensic specialist and one of his colleagues at MUNUSCO, the United Nations mission in the country. The verdict in Vital Camere's trial is expected to be handed down on Saturday. In South Africa, a protest took place in Cape Town on Tuesday where a few demonstrators demanded the removal of statues of colonial and apartheid leaders. So basically we're here today to challenge the establishment and to challenge all of these colonial and apartheid monuments all around the country and specifically starting with Louis Botha. I feel that that is so profound that we're starting with Louis Botha because he was the first Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa, which presented itself as a very oppressive regime in South Africa. Remove all colonial and apartheid monuments because they continue to present oppression, psychological oppression, psychological trauma on black people. The demonstrators, mainly composed of young people who protested on Youth Day, said the removal of colonial monuments was long overdue. As statues of colonialists in the United States and Europe are being removed in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, hundreds of protesters marched in Oxford on Tuesday, calling for more rights for Afro-descendants in the United Kingdom. Protesters also demanded the removal of the statue of 19th century British imperialist Cecil Rhodes by the City Council from an Oxford University college. We're also letting Oriel College know that like, it's not going to stop until they take it down. Yeah. So. We'll keep coming. Every week we'll be back. Hey, it's me again. We want people to recognize our communities as equal. We want equal job opportunities. We want 
less police brutality. In fact, we want no police brutality against our young black men and women. We also want um, the Oxford University to take down their statues that commemorate colonialism because it was not a good thing that we had a British Empire. We had it, and I understand we have to acknowledge it in history, but it should not be celebrated as it is, as it is dehumanising our black brothers and sisters. Because this statue represents um, so much violence and hatred, and it's been there for quite a long time, and we've all have to walk past it, and especially for black people having to walk past a figure that represents that, it's, it's really disgraceful that it's still here, and uh, we really want it to go. A meeting was scheduled for today between the governing bodies of Oriel College to discuss the situation regarding the disputed statue. Finally, on the football scene, Premier League chief executive Richard Masters had urged fans to stay away from stadiums where their teams are playing once the matches resume behind closed doors this Wednesday. This warning was issued because of fears that some supporters will ignore social distancing measures by congregating outside the grounds instead of enjoying the matches at home, as fans are not allowed into any Premier League games this term for safety reasons. The Premier League resumed with Ashton Villa's home game against Sheffield United and Arsenal's trip to Manchester City after a three-month break due to the coronavirus pandemic. A full schedule of games continues over the weekend, including Liverpool's potential title clincher at Merseyside rivals Everton. That's it for today. Thank you for watching Vox News.